Welcome to Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. I am delighted to welcome our guest today, Chris Nolan. Chris is a multiple Emmy award-winning filmmaker, author, and storyteller. He recently released a documentary called It's VUCA, The Secret to Living in the 21st Century. And we're gonna unpack one component of the It's VUCA video, and that is how leaders use story across a range of applications to elevate their brand, their client engagement, and their employee engagement, among others. So Chris, welcome. Why don't you start with what is It's VUCA? Just give us the quick overview for people who have not listened to your prior podcasts. Good to be back with you and Dan, and it's always an honor to be on Innovative Leadership and to riff and to jam with you about storytelling for leaders in the VUCA world. Basically, a better world starts with better stories, right? For leaders, better decisions each day start with better stories, too. When we talk about VUCA, we're really talking about something that was coined by the U.S. Army 30 years ago to define a world that was volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And what this did is this presents intense problems for our evolutionary brains that crave predictability and certainty. But today, we have something what we call VUCA Max. It's massively accelerating exponentially, okay? And that's causing rapid change and goes beyond just uncertainty. It leaves us with this relentless anxiety and this feeling of helplessness. Three quarters of the world are fearful of the future. So we live in this world of massive pervasive change, mega trends and metaverses. In the next 10 years, we'll see 250 years of change. So VUCA Max is a program that we put together to help make sense of this fast changing world, embrace the future through uh, the program, which really takes you on a side hero's journey of leadership is through stories. It's how we prepare for tomorrow. It's how we can see a pattern toward outcomes. So as we talk about the story of the future, one of the things that strikes me as we're recording this today, yesterday, Lawrence Livermore just did their first successful fusion test. And so we think of the possibility. Now, this is still, you know, not tomorrow possibility, but this creates the opportunity for a carbon-free fueling across the globe. So we've got all of the negative stuff. People are afraid. And we also have a world in which we are solving some of the biggest problems of our lifetimes and of our era. The volume of change that you're talking about massively accelerating as leaders being clear that we're not over indexing on the risks we also can't be delusional but being clear that there are massive changes which creates both risk and opportunity and those filter into our story as we talk about where we are leading our organizations seems foundational oh that's an excellent topic I just wrote an article on this, Can Storytelling Change the Future? Now, here's the issues. It wasn't always like this. One time we celebrated the future, we had World's Fairs, we had Star Trek, we had all kinds of programming that was like, oh, great, we're going to be glorious, it's going to be wonderful. But somehow that shifted, and we can talk about the reasons for that. But right now we have a dystopian narrative in the world about stories. Now, Talking about nuclear energy, that's very interesting because we just launched a documentary called It's VUCA. We're now doing a global documentary along the same lines. Basically, it's about the good future. Now, here's the issues with story, and you probably know this being leaders. It takes five times more good stories to counter a bad story. Once people get bad stories in their mind, it's a big deal. You have to rebrand things. For instance, you remember New York, the city of New York in 1975, no one visited New York, it garbage on the streets. It was a dystopia, right? So they did, I love New York, right? And that changed the narrative of New York. So you can rebrand a city, you can also rebrand a country. In 1975, Iceland was 100% on coal. Nobody visited Iceland, it was not a big tourist place. Now, 
Iceland is basically the most sustainable, most green country there. It's 100% geothermal or wind. It's all completely green. And they have 17 times more tourists in Iceland than they do people. So you can rebrand a country. And right now, what we have to do is going to sound kind of crazy, but I'm a marketing guy. We have to rebrand the future. And like you said, these stories about nuclear fusion are great. But right now, what's happening is they've reduced nuclear reactors. They've made them safer. And I think I just saw something. It's going to sound crazy. They're like 1% of the size that they used to be, like 50 years ago. And like Macron in France is all into this. France is going to be completely nuclear powered in the future. And you're right. Those stories need to be told about how we're lowering our carbon footprint. Nuclear is the way to go. There's no question about it. Yeah, so that's part of the thrust of this new documentary is to flip that script. But segue to where we are with leaders, it's the same thing they need to do with their cultures because their cultures are all now not wanting to stay with the company. Do they have the right purpose? Do they have the right strategy for the future? Do they have the right change story? Do they have the right vision? Those are all stories. Post-COVID, the story, I think in many cases, has not yet been rewritten. And you talked about how our brains function in predict and control environments versus a faster and more volatile and uncertain environment. Oh, that's huge. It was once more predictable. We were into efficiency. Look, it hasn't been that long ago, 100 years ago, the way that we got information was a force right? Yeah, a man on a horse. Man on a horse, right. Now it's a nanosecond away on your phone, ding all the time, and you know everything. That is a recalibration of how we think. And I don't think that leaders and people have really caught up to that. There are some skill sets that are new. You have to get more into creativity, more into intuition, more into higher faculties of learning than just collecting research and collecting information, which is what a lot of companies are about. They're basically data farms because that's what computers do. The creativity and the synthesis are the things that can't be done by AI. The others will be done at some point by machines. And are being done by machines very fast. <laughs> that's why Elon Musk goes into a company and a lot of companies, they clean out middle management. Boom, God. And who do you think is replacing those people? Bots. So, yeah, so if you're a leader, why do I need to sharpen my saw? Well, <laughs> what's around the corner? If you don't have some of these vertical learning skill sets, these higher consciousness, better leadership skills. A computer doesn't have leadership skills. It doesn't have empathy. Then chaos is where the brain excels in creativity. They say, bless the mess, you know? Astro Teller, who's the captain of moonshots at Google X, he celebrates the myths. They want to break things down. Yay! We failed. We're on the right track. Let's go back to story and the positive VUCA side of story. Can you walk us through that, starting with vision? Vision in the VUCA world and in the VUCA Max world shifts a little bit more. Like you had Simon Sinek with the why, which is vision, right? Our vision. In a VUCA world, you need a global vision. You need a massive transformative purpose, a big why, because your people need a bigger purpose. They need to know that they're part of the global community. Massive transformative purpose is what singularity teaches. You know, it's what Peter Diamandis teaches. It's about moonshots. You know, there's a story about the bricklayer, of course. He says, am I laying bricks? Am I building a wall or am I building a cathedral? Right? Those are the things basically that an employee wants to be part of. And I don't know if you know this one story. I think Warden did this research where they had two groups of people that were fundraising for the university. And one group was given more money. The other part of the group was actually shown success stories, purpose stories of what the funding would bring to the university. And after a month, the second group blew the doors off of fundraising tripled or quadrupled it, something along those lines, which is shows you kind of like the difference between purpose and then rewarding people just with money. You know, it's why Elon Musk succeeded with Tesla's having a little bit more problems with 
Twitter convincing people that it has a bigger purpose. Another one story on Kennedy. Back in the days when he did the moonshot, what became the definition of a moonshot, saying we're going to go to the moon, he was at NASA and he came up to a uh, janitor and he says, are you enjoying your time at NASA? And he says, yes, Mr. President, I'm here to help put a man on the moon. So that's, this is a great kind of purpose story. So that's purpose. The V also stands for vulnerability. That's another thing in the positive book storytelling context. Vulnerability of having failures, what you're really trying to do, what we're really trying to see, but being transparent about that. The U is for understanding, which is pretty much clear. Storytelling is about understanding, making things more understandable patterns. The C is for clarity, because clarity is what stories bring. Stories overcome complexity and uncertainty. And they're also about connectivity. And connectivity and clarity bring you commitment. Okay, so the C kind of is widened. You have agility and adaptability, but then also with that is you have authenticity. Storytelling, it kind of adds dimension to those the positive VUCA. As we've walked through the ILI story, one of the things we've talked about is creating future-ready leaders. Correct. Which really resonates. I don't think our prior language was as compelling as future-ready. It is to me. Now, our listeners can comment and tell me it is or is not resonant with them. But innovating leadership, creating future-ready leaders. Right. Drive successful future organizations. Yeah, that's a great why. There's many different types of stories we should dig into. But the why, the big why that we talk about, whether it's a strategy or clarity, why do we exist? So if we exist to create future-ready leaders, that's great. You know, why are we taking the Mac to an, uh, an iPad? That's the why. That's the why of your story. That's the start. And that sets up, and hopefully you have a massive transformative why, that leads to the what. Uh, what do they need? What do we have to do to bring that to them? And then that leads to the when. When do they need to do it? When are we going to do it if it's a strategy story or, or clarity story? And then that leads to the outcome. And that is what you've answered. You have a why, which supports you what. The when will give you the roadmap. And the when can also be a roadmap for them. Could be the part of your year-long cohort or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? That would be the when. A client whose founders are stepping away and shepherding the next round of leaders forward may be a different time and a slightly different intervention than an organization that's trying to scale massively. You know, well, that's the different strategy story, mm -hmm. different clarity story, a different future story. And that's kind of what we're talking about here is the amount of change that you have is so tremendous that you actually have to keep updating those stories pretty frequently, at least every year. And then you need to do future back thinking. It's a combination of future mindset mastery and business story mastery, kind of combined. But I guess we could probably go into the different types of stories might be appropriate here. There's actually a bunch of types of stories, but the fundamental two types of stories are big S and small S stories. Big S story can be your brand story, so that would be something that they would be talking about. How does that change if we're scaling, if we're preparing for the future? So let's talk about one of the things that's different about a business today and why Apple is so genius. Apple is the most genius company there are because what Apple does is it's a core business. And then what it does is it doesn't just, you know, you hear about disrupt yourself, but they're beyond disrupting yourself. So what they do is create pods out from the core that disrupt other industries. For instance, the iWatch will disrupt health pretty soon. They've got the car coming out in another year. They disrupted music. Amazon's trying to do this too, but then they'll, they'll probably, I don't know, I think they're going to end up buying Disney, to tell you the truth, but they're going to disrupt entertainment. So if you're a company and you're trying to scale, what does that mean? Are you just scaling incrementally, which is kind of suicide, which is what they do? Like, oh, we just made a little, we got some new technology in. Well, great, but that's not going to help you future back think. So you really have to have pods. So you're talking about stories for each one of those units. For our listeners to level set, what is future back thinking? Because you're using a term that not everyone shares a definition of. Well, you talk about future mindset mastery. Now we're going to get a little bit in the weeds here. Everybody has a problem with the future. You have something called a, a medial prefrontal cortex, which tells us who we are. We wake up in the morning, we have a cup of coffee, we know this, we know that, we have a routine. That's your medial prefrontal cortex telling you who you are. Now, what about next month? 
Well, I kind of see that person a little bit. What about three months? I kind of see that person a little bit. What about a year from now? Well, maybe. What about five? You become a stranger to yourself really fast because your brain can't visualize it. So that's why we have a problem with things like week programs, planning for retirement, all of those things that are in the future that we kind of can't quite see ourselves. So we need to visualize the future. We have to put ourselves three years, five years, visually create scenarios of what the future is like, put ourselves there so we kind of train our brain to understand that we're not a stranger in the future. Now, we've talked about the adjacent future. So there's a hack for that. Okay, I think it's Stephen Johnson. It's called the adjacent future. Think of the future, and this is future back thinking too, because you've got to take the future and bring it to the present. It's also manifestation. We can get into that too. But basically what the adjacent future is, think of the future as hovering over us. It's a shadow that hovers over us. So it's really part of today. This is very quantum, right? Because there is no time. So the time really is now. It is the future. Now, there's also a thing called the RAS, which is a reticular activating system, which is in the back of your brain. Whatever you tell it, it goes for. That's how you manifest stuff. So when you visualize the future, you're actually programming a part of your brain to seek that future. So that's when we do business training. We go for a preferred future, future back thinking. You're using some language that has been kind of in the mystical traditions, but you're giving the science for it. Yeah. So if I visualize, it's not magic. It's that I'm programming a part of my brain to seek that thing. And if I continually focus on that thing and visualize every day, there's actually some interesting research on as I visualize, Robert Fritz talks about this, that my brain wants to close that gap. 100%. I am using more consciously and deliberately a function of my brain that we don't often index on because we didn't get that part of the manual. You're a nine-year-old kid. You want to be an astronaut? You just think astronaut, astronaut, astronaut. You do everything. You you know, you really keep going for it. And it takes perseverance and grit, too. You point yourself in that direction. You see a car on the road you want, right? You want a pickup truck? I like that pickup truck. See the pickup truck? You'll start to see that pickup truck everywhere. Your brain will just start to focus on it. And pretty soon, you probably have that pickup truck. Or the sports car. Now, you can't go too far. You can't say, I see myself on the moon and keep visualizing. Well, maybe. I mean, that could happen, too. But I mean, there's some parameters with this, but yes, it's goal setting, for lack of a better term. That future back thinking then integrates into the foundation of my stories. 100% because it's a futurist term, future back thinking. It's really thinking about the future more than we do. Because if we don't, as you said, future ready, the way we can only be future ready is to visualize the future more because the future's here, really. The future's moving faster than we think. So we really want to catch up with it by understanding, diving into it. What are the future possibilities for me? What are the future of growth for us? What's the future of life, work, and relationships? What's the future of performance? What's the future of foresight? What's the future of creativity? Just start diving into that and having much more future mastery you'll be more prepared for uncertainty and you'll start to embrace change work. Can you give us an example? You've worked with Google and Apple and Disney and a long list of folks. How have they used Visualize the Future, use future back thinking and create the story that then inspires either their customers or their employees or everybody? Oh, I got a great story for you. So we were brought in by an API company, right? APIs are the, the basically the backroom engineering for apps in the cloud. And it's geeky. It's very geeky. It's very technical. Why when you go somebody you, where you get like a GPS alert or why it knows your likes or your dislikes. Getting into the weeds on that stuff kind of blows your mind, right? So they wanted to take a strategy story. How do we tell people about this and make it cool? Now, it's all about the future, of course, because APIs are all about the future. It's all about apps, right? Apps are the future. That it had to be a sales tool because their clients were API engineers, putting those into different platforms and, and different technical uh, gadgets, gazmos and things, you know. And they wanted to make it an event. So it was a strategy story. We wanted a strategy. It was a future story. 
It's the future. So what we did is we broke it down and we said, the only way you're really going to be able to do this is to do what we call a big ass story. Big ass story is cinematic. A small ass story is like a customer story or an employee story or purpose story, a success story, something that's happened in the company, right? It's a testimonial to a point, but you can make it into a big ass story too. So what we did was think of like Apple's 1984. You know, that you're familiar with that commercial where Apple was launched and they did a whole thing about dystopia and they had looked like 1984, but a woman came in with a sledgehammer and threw it at the big brother screen and exploded it. So it was kind of a movie. So we came up with a theme, a future theme, which was adapt or die. That's the strategy. If you don't adapt, you're going to die. But how do we make that into a story then? So what we did is we placed it in the near future and we made it a spy thriller. The one is probably easier because it was about fintech. It'll be, it'll be quicker to tell you. We did one about travel and one about fintech. The young woman, like she's 30 years old, wakes up in the basement in Berlin of an industrial center. Doesn't know who, what her name is, where she is. It's kind of like the born identity. Her only way out of it is on her wrist, she has a bot that's a hologram bot that comes alive and says, can I help you? Right? She doesn't know what this bot is, what's it about. She's asking questions. Very weird. Seems that she works for a new bank. She was on some kind of mission. We're not really sure what it is. But we know she's been threatened because some Russian hackers or terrorists are after her. So we don't know anything about what's going on. But basically, she's on the run from these terrorists. And then she has these flashbacks where she was downloading something from a computer. She's with some, some hackers that want some information from her. She jumps, she runs across the roof, runs across town. Then this bot helps her buy things, helps her buy a motorcycle and shows her where to go. In other words, the bot's helping her through the mission, so to speak. And she, she gets on a motorcycle. She's being pursued and guys with motorcycle. They have guns. A lot of action. The bot takes her to the new bank lab, which turns out to be, of course, it's the app center. And we find out this has been a chaos protocol. And it's what actually Amazon does and the, and the army does is they put apps and they put the computer system through what's called a chaos protocol. It sometimes doesn't even know that it's on this chaos protocol. In other words, the bot did not know that this was a protocol. We're living the story through the bot. And what we realize is that the thing that they put the bot through is all the tech we're going to give you now. This is how this happened. This is how this happened. All based on APIs. This is about financial security. So she was a security advisor, cybersecurity advisor within this app company running the system. And we learned all about the story in flashbacks at the end. But it was so entertaining. It was a 10-minute movie that premiered in London around the world at movie theaters. That company ended up 10xing their sales or something like that and ended up selling to Google. It actually started off as a strategy story, became a future story, and then became a brand story. And then, of course, the geeks loved it because the geek is the hero. The geek engineer is the hero of the story. So they're all, yay. And that took some discovery. It did just like pop out of nowhere. We, we looked at two or three different ways to go, ended up with that. On top of that, how we get into leadership storytelling, the leaderships all had stories on top of that, which we also filmed. And then we also filmed the employees within each one of those divisions that builds those apps talking about those stories. So it's stories, beget stories, beget stories. And then that begets purpose, purpose stories. So that's how a big ass story can be broken down into a lot of tiny, smaller ass stories. And it's all a leadership campaign. To get there, you've talked about story spotting and story scripting. Because I hear that, like, this is a really good idea. It's cool. I wish I could afford to do my own big story movie. But many of us are going to start where I do, which is help me understand this because I'm not in a position to do a big S story movie. That's a story done with video, which I highly recommend. But you can also work on an oral story that's really tight and really sounds cool. We could say, imagine if you did this and if this happened and that happened. We also do that, which is why when we work together, I said, so personalize it for me. How did this happen? And then you personalize that. But if you were to take some of the great stuff that is with innovative leadership, you could outpicture that into a future story. 
So imagine this happens and this happens and this happens. And we craft a story just exactly like you are doing a movie. We create a leadership scenario that has some of those similar beats to it. By the way, remember this was directed towards the travel industry on one hand and fintech. So we craft the story. Imagine an engineering firm that's building a dam in 2040. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing where you say the leaders need this and they need that. You can build that story. You just have to build in visual cues and anchor people with visuals, but also maybe a timestamp. In remember, it's 2035. This is happening. This is happening. This is a big picture. One of the data points I sent you was McKinsey has said that 75% of the S&P 500 companies won't exist in 2027. Right. Now, some of them will be acquired and this will be a celebration. Others will be defunct, not a celebration. How do we as leaders navigate through the next five years? And, and then it gets even more complex and uncertain. And, and leaders don't last that long. And you have to go to people like Steve Jobs and Bob Iger. What do they do differently? What do they anchor everything on? Storytelling. So I, I just mentioned the Apple scenario. So you've got a leader. He wants to be a change maker, which is really difficult in company, you know, because they're worried about the bottom line. They're worried about next quarter. They're not future back thinking. They're not doing a lot of this stuff. So what could he do? It's the same thing we just talked about. He can tell a story. We would have to work with him on it. Let's craft that story of imagine us as an engineering firm in five years. We've got pods that do this and pods that do that and people asking this and our purpose is about that. We're building the the nuclear fusion plants. We're we're building the new cities of tomorrow. We're doing and you paint the picture, right? He's like Steve Jobs saying, Why do we shift? Why are we doing this? And that's what we talked about. Stories are about discovery. So story hunting. So you hunt for where are we going to go? Hunt for those stories. Where do we want to go? What could we do? That's part of a workshop, strategy workshop. Let's say he needs, he says, I want to do a vision story. I want to do a change story that really is inspirational. I don't even know if it's really going to stick to the wall, but I want to do that because I think we need that for the company. It's just oral. You know, it's just something you can do in a video even. You can sit down and say, let me paint you a picture. I tell you, Marie, more times than not, when you have a well-crafted story, even at the beginning of a pitch versus a PowerPoint, you'll make a sell much faster. It'll stick in people's mind. They'll be engaged. You know, and you can practice that story. You can really rehearse it and get it down, videotape yourself and everything like that. And then when you give it in front of a group, I mean, they're stunned. You know, they're like, it's like Steve Jobs. You're just like, wow. And their brains are lit up. You know, stories light up every part of our brain. Like if you're telling facts and stuff, it doesn't slip in the right slots, right? Like like the fact you just told, you need to tell that as a story. Try to craft that into a story and say, let me paint you a picture. You're this, you're that. First of all, it just stops people. They go, oh, they're in a story. I'm going to take a shot at, at, as you go through these. And if it's bad, Dan will edit it out. The statistic I gave is in 2027, so I've used your time marker. Yeah. 75% of the S&P 500 companies won't exist. So my story is imagine as a leader, you're sitting down reading the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg with a cup of coffee on a Saturday morning in 2027. We're still drinking coffee on Saturday mornings. With ayahuasca in it. <laughs> Potentially. That makes it a very different conversation, though. <laughs> um, so I'm drinking my coffee and thinking about what's happened in the last five years of my life and projecting what's going to happen forward. As I look at the journal, I realize that the top 10 companies, none of them were in the top 10 five years ago. Instead, all of these companies have emerged like we've seen over the last 20 years. Apple wasn't so prominent back then. Disney may not have been so prominent. Google certainly wasn't. Alphabet wasn't. Five years from now, none of those top 10 were on our radar now. The leaders of those companies are names we didn't know. They are not Chainsaw Al or pick some of the, the names we know now. They're not maybe Elon Musk. They're people we haven't heard yet. As a leader, I'm thinking, how do I craft my future? 
because we also know that since those leaders weren't prominent back then, if I want to be a successful leader, I need to be doing things differently than I was in 2027. How do I think about my future? How do I create it rather than having it create me? So how's that as a story? It's great. And I think the key here is your future ready because, you know, I'm talking to all kinds of companies in Europe right now that are AI companies. And they're making money in this recession. Better believe it. The robotics companies and the AI companies are kicking down the doors. When we can't hire people, robotics companies are suddenly very popular. Once again, we're talking about future back thinking or future ready thinking. So let's say you're taking from a positive standpoint. You're having that coffee five years from now. And you're reading about a lot of the companies that didn't do what you did, that didn't look at AI, didn't look at robotics, didn't look at the smaller companies that were eating away at the edges, didn't do this. And you had the vision to do that. Yes, it was really hard. Yeah. Was it easy to get Iceland 100% geothermal and, you know, sustainable? Took a while, took a good story, took good ideas, big ideas. It's kind of swinging big, swinging for the fences. But you did that. You're sitting there and you're reading about a friend that's, you know, no longer in business. But maybe what you did combined humanity and technology. This, I think you want to weave into it, you know, that story. But you saw AI coming. You saw robotics coming. But you also saw that you needed to give people new skill sets, new capabilities. Do you know that right now people have a thousand times more of the potential and capabilities and connectivity that they did 20 years ago? They have a thousand times more potential because look at all the stuff that they can do, right? A small little team can do what a country used to do. And we're seemingly more connected. You can get online and build a platform overnight, which is why you can build a company in four months. You could celebrate it. It was messy. You know, I had a lot of failures. I had to go up against the stakeholders and tell this and this and tell them that. But we got through it. And you know what? We have purpose now. People are happy. I was able to keep a third more of the workforce than I would have if I, at the last minute, I had to go to AI. You can reinforce the protopia, so to speak. To the point I made earlier, it doesn't paint a delusional story where, you know, I put on my cape and I flew above all the problems, but it was challenging. Oh, no, you can't do that. In fact, a story is about adversity. A story is VUCA. The only difference between a business story and the hero's journey The hero's journey is always about some nobody, a nobody that becomes somebody, Rocky, Luke Skywalker. You're usually nobodies. A business story is about somebody that's somebody, and that somebody is facing adversity and conflict, obstacles, and is getting through it. That is the story. If you tell that story, you've got to build in problems we had. People were naysaying. They didn't want to do this. I was, my job might have been on the line for a while. We made some breakthroughs. The Apple story is really where people have to go. But Google does it too. That's Google X. Most companies that are going to be successful, they're not really disrupting their core business. They're morphing, kludging, blue oceaning, that kind of thing. But they're disrupting other industries because everything's converging. The car business is basically the computer business. That's where you talked about Apple disrupting health and disrupting driving. Yeah, because when you get into the future of stuff, that's really where it gets really interesting when you're starting to talk to one company versus another because you see that their businesses are are overlapping so much. I think that's the biggest challenge for leaders. We talked about USAA. USAA doesn't do health. They do home and they do auto. Insurance is going to go from, for instance, a risk business to a prevention business. As soon as they have sensors that can sensor minute to second to second what's going on with you, they're going to go, oh, Maureen, I think you had a cigarette. Yeah, oh, Maureen, you drove too fast. Yeah, oh, some of that stuff, yeah. But they're going to know a lot about you, but it's also allowing them to bring costs crashing down for young people. You know, there's a company called Lemonade in, in New York. There's basically peer-to-peer, and that's the disruptions that are happening. And so a tech company is going to become an insurance company. It seems like everyone is now a tech company and a data company. Yeah, And it's interesting that you were talking about you were giving some facts and stuff. The thing that is hard with so much data is you do have to storify it. If that's one thing that you could do in stories, as we just did with the API story, it basically has a lot of data at the end, but you're so interested 
in how they did stuff, because you've just seen how this bot did it, that the data is storified. So mine isn't yet there, but the idea that five years from now, I'm successful, so I've beaten the average, that the average executive is now 4.9 years lifespan. Right. And my company is among the 25% that have succeeded, while again, many of my friends are trying to retool. And retooling is much harder than when I don't have a job. I've got time to do it, but it's hard. Remember I told you that from being a director and doing so many of these story workshops, we do props and triggers and different techniques. So let's take that one step further and personalize that story. As you personalize your journal story, and I'll tell you some of that, we're talking about the backroom engineering to it. The best way for a person to start a story, a business story, is to start with, in storytelling, it's called the inciting incident. Sometimes that can be, in a movie, you'll see it in the first scene. Star Wars, Princess Leia appears. She's programming the computer. That's kind of a foreshadowing and inciting moment, right? Because when we see her, that's the inciting moment. So when you talked about what catalyzed your future-ready concept, that's a very big hook for people. People lean in with inciting, well, really, that's when that happened, right? So you're talking about your exec with that cup of coffee. I remember back in 2023 when, you know, this happened. Mm -hmm. Somebody came in and they said this and they said this. There's this new technology. There's this new competitor. There's been a change in the marketplace. Regulations have changed. I said we had to do something different. So I gave Maureen Metcalf a call in Innovative Leadership. I said, what do I need to do for the future? And you give him the new realization. Well, here's the realization. It's this and this and this. Then you tell your story. 70% of the business is whatever. Mm -hmm. Four years, they'll be gone. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. So you can see it starts to move into a story. You're giving him the obstacles. And you're showing them. You're telling him, there will be external and internal conflicts and adversity. You will face internal heat from stakeholders, from your employees. In your company and in your own head. Part of the internal conflict is the way I used to make sense of things, and I know it in my own story. There are things I'm overcoming because of how I see the world or choices I've made that I need to stop doing. Right. There's an imposter syndrome. Can't I see the future? I can't see the future, but I'm going to try, whatever that is. You know, what I'm trying to show you is the backroom engineering is I'm giving you a story, but I'm giving you the second beat first. I'm not giving you the status quo. Status quo, you add, maybe the industry was like this or whatever. You start with the inciting incident. So maybe you have the inciting incident. So there's a couple ways you can do it. So you can do, let's say you were telling that story. So you had a cup of coffee. I remember when I, when I first heard about this, I went to see Maureen Metcalf, but our company was this at the time. That's the backstory. That's the status quo. So you're kind of saying, we were doing this way. We were still locked down. We were living We were really living in the 2000s. We were doing that. And I didn't really know how to do it, right? But then I had this new realization. So you can see you're kind of building the arc. Now, there's the last part of that, which is jumping into the future. So you want to jump into the outcomes, too. So I'm giving you the building blocks of the personal start of the inciting incident, the catalyst for it, changing the marketplace, technology, competitor, the new realization that either they discovered, but in your story, you help them discover that. Because of those strategic choices that we made, we had this outcome. I'm still in my job. I'm now one of the top 10 companies. Whatever those are, people at purpose, I was able to keep a third more of my staff, on and on. Those were the outcomes, but you framed it like a story. And you become the mentor. You're Obi-Wan. I love Yoda and Obi-Wan. So I've, that does resonate because I am of the age where I grew up with those stories. A friend of mine, Sean Callahan, who runs Anecdote, which is the world's largest leadership storytelling outfit, he doesn't like the hero's journey, and he doesn't like the idea of the mentor. He says, because in most hero's journey movies, not, the mentor dies. Obi-Wan didn't make it, remember? Yeah, a lot of those stories, the mentor does not pull through. But we're using it as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. It's kind of in the past, how things were before the change happened. Then something happened. I had this real, I found this out. Citing instant catalyst. So now I had to make these decisions because Maureen said this and this and this, brought me through this, recountered that problem. And in the future now, here we are. 
So that's kind of how it works. And you could put in a great picture. It could be a clarity story, strategy story. So we just need to then do our video after we've created the story. Well, you can spice it up with, uh, you know, there's a lot of great oral visual storytelling where you've got to anchor people in some real things, you know. Like I said, a timestamp's really good. Give it a location. We were in Columbus. I went into her office. We are sharing an anecdote about something, you know, and we talked about this and then we talked. You can add flavor to it that makes it seem like it's not just all building blocks to a, a success story. It sounds way less compelling to be in an office in Columbus, Ohio, than running through the Amazon rainforest. Yeah, we'll make it, uh, we were both vacationing somewhere, Costa Rica, an echo resort. You know, we got to talking about the future, whatever the hell it is, and how things should be sustainable. You could paint the picture anywhere you want. We were in a jet, we were doing this. You could embellish it. Sounds more compelling. This is what I would do, whether it was a brand story, a workshop with an executive. Maybe an executive is saying, I, you know, I, I keep telling them we should change and I should keep telling them I should have a vision and we've come out of COVID, this is our opportunity and this and that. And just not seeming to able to move the needle here. Well, I'm really responding to it. Well, it's probably the story you're telling. You're not telling a story. Can you walk the listener through what is the basic scripting process? I realize most people won't listen to the podcast and go off and knock it out of the park, but give us a sense of what that looks like. Well, I mentioned the what, why, when, outcome idea. That's kind of an, a way of going through it. It's really kind of a storyboarding idea that we've kind of adapted it also. We have our workshops. There's a bit of a business model canvas to it, too. The Bucamax program has a story ladder where you make it more concrete. So there's all these different workshop vehicles to discover your story. You've also seen the, uh, the story triangle that I have, which is the kind of a future triangle. Call to action, the pull to pass, story drivers, goals, mission purpose, obstacles, conflicts. These are all part of a storyboard that we put together depending on what kind of story you need. Is it a change story? Is it a brand story? There's also small S stories where let's say you want to do, French Fritz Carlton has something called wow stories. These wow stories are collected from employees about customers. They're real stories. They're testimonials, but they kind of wow them. They kind of craft them a little bit beyond just a basic testimonial. So the process is really just story discovery first. Getting in, workshop, what do you want to accomplish? What are you having problems with? What would you like to do? And then just by listening sometimes, those stories really need to be developed, even orally, because those become purpose stories. They also help drive vision stories. Stories beget stories. Scripting can also be story mapping. You can also script the future. You can script the present. You can script the past. You can script all this kind of stuff. We've done some of it, but it's just much more in the weeds. So it's a discovery process. So let's say your thing. So you started off with, I think it was mostly started off as kind of a pitch story or more of a sales story or something along those lines. It morphed to somewhat of a brand story that became kind of a strategy story, then a vision story and a future story. So it kind of started to morph, and we didn't even get into what would we call success stories that would support those. I mentioned the API company. With that, we also did success stories. What I'm saying here is that it's a complete business story mastery, future mindset mastery. We call it storifying. We storify a company, and that helps across the board, all those things. I mean, I can't tell you how much it helps especially for a senior exec, to be able to step forward five years or whatever the increment is. And I, I know that we don't have perfect insight into what's going to happen next week, let alone five years. But for me as a leader to paint the image for my company, for the people that work with me, for my clients, for all of our stakeholders, imagine a world where X seems crucial to then be able to step back and say, okay, if we are this kind of impact, massive transformational purpose, touching a billion people in 20 years, 
leaders of the future will have solved X kinds of big issues, like we have a carbon neutral fuel source. It, it's not that I invest in saving trees in the Amazon. It's that I don't need to. I may still do that, but I don't need to because we've now identified a new energy source. Other leaders in the healthcare space have solved the problem of cancer. There is no more cancer. Now, what has to happen for leaders of today? So if I'm not Yoda or Obi-Wan because I get killed, maybe I'm, what are female wizards called? Is there a thing? Sorceresses. So it's a snowball effect. We mentioned Bob Iger. Bob Iger came back to Disney because he said that it's a storytelling company, okay? And it stopped being a storytelling company. It's a story company. It's totally in its DNA. So if you're a storytelling company, it changes your DNA, okay? For instance, when you're a company like Nokia and you become a storytelling company, the CEO is a storyteller, but then that snowballs into your sales department and they become storytellers. So let's say you're telling the story of the future. Well, then that becomes also your sales department's presentation where everybody's telling that story and it's changing your sales, right? It's changing everything about the company because all of a sudden you have kind of a different zeitgeist to you, right? If you're a censure, a censure is also a storytelling company. They are telling the stories of the companies that they're creating stories for. So it's kind of like one big global story. Another big storytelling company is Airbnb. They celebrate the stories of both sides, people that rent B&Bs out, you know, and the tours of B&Bs. I don't know. I'll, t I'll probably end this on one great B&B story. And this was animated, actually. It was about a, a woman who rented an Airbnb in East Berlin, and it turned out to be the owner was the guard from East Berlin, and her father happened to be the guard from West Berlin. And through Airbnb, these two guards met on the other side of the Berlin Wall, obviously, you know, it's like Airbnb brings peace, right? A great story. I mean, I'm telling you, almost every company I work with, there's gold in their stories and they just, they just let them go. And you would call that a small S story that's made into a big S story. But you could tell that story if you're the CEO of Airbnb, just orally. If it's wonderful, create a couple, you know, three minute piece of content from it, let your audience see it, your social media see it, and your employees see it. And all it does is bring purpose to your company. So I'm going to make a commitment that for your and my next interview, we are going to have a story to share about either ILI or your work and how we're collaborating more closely. How's that? Okay. I'm going to want to make a video out of it, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so either we better get it done quickly or you're never going to be on the podcast again. So <laughs> I, I would like to stay on our quarterly cadence. And after we do the story, we'll walk the listeners through how they might do this for their own story. How's that sound? That sounds good. Yeah. And it depends which way you want to go. Do you want to do the mentor story or do you want to do your story, how you came up with it? Which way do you want to go? I love the wizard idea. I want to be the female wizard. But we'll figure out if that's really the story that needs to happen. No, no, that's okay. No, that's okay because... um. There's actually a guy who's got causal layer analysis. It's a futurist, and he actually has metaphors like that. He says, create a metaphor for who you are. A lot of times it's like I'm a hamster on a treadmill and that kind of thing, you know. But your wizard metaphor is wonderful. So you start there and then say, take that metaphor all the way through to the end. That's another story prop. I've never used kind of the fairy tale kind of prop, the metaphor prop, but it's a good one. Then the question is, do I get to wear a hat? Do I get to wear a pointed hat as the wizard? See, that's the kind of stuff that is good to put in the story. Those little little anecdotes and stuff are what make people go, ah, and then that fires a different part of the brain up. They go, they imagine you in a hat. So one of my clients actually made a magic wand for me, a custom-made wand because of the hat that I was wearing in one of our podcasts. I actually have the wand and the hat. That's wonderful. Chris, this has been brilliant, and we will clearly move forward with my story, potentially as the wizard. How would listeners learn more about what you do, learn more about VUCA Max, give us the location of the VUCA Max documentary? How do they find you? 
everything's on itsbuka.com. Or for stories, you could probably just get a hold of me, actually, at chris at 90,000feet.com. That's the content company that we do stuff for Google and Disney. If that's where you want to go, much more big-ass stories. We do a lot of storytelling through VUCA Max, which is our leadership program, which we have six cohorts that take you through our hero's journey all based on different levers of the future possibilities. I mentioned the future of, of growth, future of life, work, and relationships, future of performance, future of innovation, and then the future or future of leadership, and then the future of creativity and courage. That's the VUCA Max system, which is individual coaching, and then we do a, a long-term coaching and corporate coaching too. And then, of course, LinkedIn, that's probably where I answer most of those DMs, Chris Nolan at LinkedIn. But LinkedIn's probably the best. If you want to get a hold of me and you have questions, more questions about storifying your company, how to be more future mindset mastery. The other one is, like I said, was business story mastery, which go together. Cool. And for innovative leadership, like us, follow us. Thank you for listening. And listen to our next episode with Chris and I helping ILI create its compelling story, which will be a process. You can follow us, our newsletter, our company, and me separately on LinkedIn. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you so much. This was a great time. Always fun to wrap with you guys. It's always such a pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris.